General Nathaniel Green is one of those figures who just kind of stands out in American history. Uh, by the end of the American Revolution, he was certainly George Washington's most trusted general and really had just such a major impact on the war, uh, especially in the Southern theater of the war. And outside of that, you know, serving as quartermaster around the time of Valley Forge and turning around the logistics and supply side of the army, he was able to really take those skills to the Southern colonies where he was, you know, really able to excel. And uh, not just that, he, uh, just an interesting man in general. From his upbringing here in Rhode Island, where I'm at now, all the way down to his untimely death in Georgia and burial in Savannah. It, it's really just a fascinating, uh, oftentimes sad story, but I don't think Nathaniel Green often gets the due respect he deserves for the contributions he made to this country. Now this is the home of Nathaniel Green. It was designed by Nathaniel himself and built in 1770. And this was built here at Coventry Ironworks, which was a family business of the Greens. And you know, here at the Ironworks, they built things such as, uh, you know, anchor chains, anchors, different tools and things of that, things of that like. But uh, this is a two and a half story Georgian style colonial. It has four rooms on the first floor, separated by a central hall, four rooms on the second floor and six rooms in the attic. It also has an even number of windows in each room on the first two floors to allow, you know, sort of a flood of light during daylight hours. And also a passageway between rooms facilitated the flow of fresh air. So this was a really well thought out design of a house. And, uh, you know, it's kind of the pride and joy of Nathaniel Green. Now, Nathaniel Green lived in this house in the early 1770s leading up to the American Revolution. Today, it's known as the Nathaniel Green Homestead. Now, another name for this home is Spell Hall. And when I first heard that, I was kind of like, wait, you know, is it had to do with like witchcraft or something strange? No, in reality, uh, Nathaniel Green, although a Quaker, uh, really enjoyed reading and education. And that wasn't necessarily something the Quakers were fond of in the sense of, you know, outside of a, a in-depth knowledge of the Bible, um, you know, that was something that they didn't necessarily, you know, like. But Nathaniel Green was quite bookish and loved to read. And because of that, he actually taught the children of the men who worked here at his forge here in the house. And because of that, because of the schooling that took place here, it took on the name of Spell Hall. All right, guys, I'm inside the Nathaniel Green Homestead, and uh, with me today is Josh. How are you? And uh, Josh is uh, one of the curators here. You said you also do a lot of the kind of maintenance and repairs. Maintenance work, board member, yard work, you name it. Yeah, so Josh does just about everything here uh, to keep this historic home in place and, and preserved. And uh, he's one of the many awesome folks that help keep this home really, really around so all of us can come and enjoy it. So today's Josh is going to be giving me a little bit of a personal tour around the homestead, and, and we'll learn some stuff along the way. That's uh, Nathaniel Green up there above the fireplace. That is, that is him. Uh, the portrait is actually the only known portrait he's ever sat for. And uh, wow. it is said to have been painted in the Gilbert Stewart portrait shop. Um, so okay. Gilbert Stewart, a very famous known painter. It's believed that the body was done most likely by an apprentice. You know, someone new comes in, would do the less detailed things. Again, this was something that was looked at by RISD some years ago before my time. And uh, they, through their expert opinion, decided that the body was an apprentice and someone was more of skilled and they, they suggested that it could have been one of um, Gilbert's daughters, potentially his daughter Jane, but we haven't really figured out the timeline to fit that quite in there yet, but it is an original painting. Close friends with the, with the Washingtons. Okay, they, they really were, stuck with the Washington namesake yeah, then. Yeah. That's pretty cool. And you said this is George Washington Green, and that was uh, Nathaniel Green's first son? Yep, oldest son. Okay. 
And then their first daughter, Martha Washington Green. Born 1777. So during the war, actually. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, most of their children were actually conceived uh, when Nathaniel was in camp. Um, you hear of George and Nathaniel both telling uh, Martha and Catherine, you know, don't come to camps. You know, there was that whole controversy over like camp followers. And, right. You know, do we want these women in camp and what's going on? And both Nathaniel's wife and George's wife were often very kind of rebellious against that. We're like, okay. We're coming to see you. Yeah, they want to be around yeah. their men. Yeah. So yeah, all the all the children were born during uh, the wartime. Okay. You know? And I, I, if I remember correctly, I know Katie Green was. I guess pretty good looking, and a lot of the other officers like to dance with her, and oh, she was yeah. kind of uh, she's an outgoing woman, of her yeah. time. very fascinating woman of her time. You know, um, kind of a little over the top, I think, compared to most women of the day. Okay, you know, she was known to be very kind of um, outgoing, outspoken, flirtatious, charismatic, just different than most women of the time. And she would she. There's actually a story where she challenges George Washington to a dance competition. Oh wow, really? And balls and dancing <laughs> were a big thing back then. So she's like, hey, let's uh, let's dance. And I guess the story goes, they danced for like an hour or so. And finally he was like, nope, I'm, I'm tapping <laughs> out, I'm done. And she won the dance competition. This room here is the formal dining room. Uh, this room would be kind of where they entertain guests at dinner. Definitely, probably not where they sat and did their everyday uh, eating. It's kind of more like, uh, I kind of consider this to be like grandma's living room with the plastic on the couch. Gotcha, yeah. You know? It's there, it looks nice, but it's not right. used that often. Right. Okay, cool. Any furniture in here that's original? Or actually, we have some really cool pieces in here. Some of my favorite pieces in the house are actually in here. Uh, this here uh, is a coffee urn that was huh. given to uh, Nathaniel's wife, Catherine, when she remarries. After Nathaniel passes away, she remains a widow for a few years and then remarries a gentleman by the name of Phineas Miller. Okay. When her and Phineas are married, this was a gift from her children to her. Wow. So pretty neat. Gift. Really beautiful piece. You can actually see her initials there in the center. Just to oh yeah. Make it. This is probably one of my favorite rooms in the house. This is actually the general study. Uh, this was his room. This was the place where he did a lot of his reading. Um, he was very knowledgeable. He actually had a very large book collection. He had a book collection of about 250 books, which was unheard of at a time like that. Wow. Most people in that day and age, uh, families, they would have their Bible. So you know, you'd have a house that have their big old family Bible. Nathaniel had books. And, and this was where he kept them. I wonder if as a Quaker, you know, spending that much time on education outside of the realm of the Bible, if that was looked down upon or? It, it kind of was, you know, Quaker education to them was more or less, I like to kind of put it in this aspect to people. If you could read the Bible and kind of balance your checkbook, you were pretty good in Quaker education. You know, it, it actually took Nathaniel asking his father like, hey, I, I want to learn more, I, I want to do things. And finally his father allowed him to get a tutor and, you know, but it wasn't, education wasn't something that they valued as much. Mm. So this is where you actually see a wedding gift that was given to Catherine by Nathaniel on their wedding day. Oh, wow. So they were married uh, July 20th of 1774, right in East Greenwich, Rhode Island. A uh, beautiful colonial house, it's actually still there to this day. And on their wedding day, Nathaniel gives this to Catherine. So beautiful fan made of silk uh, and baleen. Or for those of you who don't know, baleen's kind of like whale teeth, if you will. It's like a stringy filtration system in their mouth. And that is what that's made of. If you look carefully, you can actually see her initials in the center of this as well. just picture it's 254 years of people coming out and turning the railing so you can 
feel like the general every morning coming out of his bedroom. Yeah. You know, kind of just stepping out in 250 years of the family, the, the guests, the, just the people that have been through here, you know, for all we know, the Marquise de Lafayette could add into some of that flattering yeah. of it. Like, it's those little subtle things that I just love. That is really neat. Yeah. Well, because you spend so much time here, these little things you're able to pick up, which is, yeah. which is awesome. Any of the uh, furniture in here original? No, unfortunately nothing in here is really original to him. The uh, table in the, in the corner is original to the family. That's actually one of our oldest pieces and passed uh, down, but I don't know if it was ever like his, his. Okay. It's still cool to see uh, family pieces or things that are of, sure. the, of the period. Sure. To kind of give you an idea of what their uh, their daily lives were, in this case, kind of their personal life. Right. You know, and you can't really tell on the, the camera, I guess, but the uh, floor also, you can really feel kind of the indentations and and how it's kind of curved. It's settled over the years. Yeah. And I just love that. Me too. Case. These wider planks, and you can usually see kind of the nail heads, the the square hand square forged nail heads, heads. Or rose heads. Or yeah, rose heads. Often referred right. to as rose heads because they kind of look like a rose petal starting to open. Okay. Yeah. Okay, that's so cool. you said a replica of a Continental General's coat. Yep. This is what the general would have worn uh, during his battles. Early mm -hmm. Rev War, you see a lot of guys hunt, uh, fighting in hunting frocks or even still wearing red coats. So we finally decided we needed that more uniform look. And that's where you end up with our uh, blue regimental coats that are so famous. Yeah, kind of the, the buff and blue. And what's on the button there? Is it so the buttons say R-I-R. -R. And it is said that when they, they made these regimental coats, um, they kind of helped to depict where people were from. Okay. So most of the regimental coats, uh, let's say, uh, such as this one, most New England colonies, um, their coats were blue with the white buff and okay. then from there the buttons would kind of denote what colony state you were from so this would be you were rhode island regular in the regular continental army okay mass would be mar and so on and so forth um when you get down south you often see blue regimentals with like um black facing or different color greens things like that and those are for you know the colonies down south. So, okay. you heard of the story of William Barton and how he kidnaps General Prescott? That's right, yeah. All right, so this dresser is said to have been owned by General William Barton. Really? Yeah. Okay, so that's another famous Rhode Islander most people have not heard yeah. of. <laughs> yeah, it's a beautiful piece. Yeah, we have a lot of stuff that was given to us by the Barton family. Um, most of the stuff in the next room over, uh, in particular, was things that was donated to us by the Barton family. And this piece, the, the tag that has been with it and kept with it for years states that it was General William Barton's. Yeah, so Nathaniel Green's bedroom there. Yep. And then this small passageway into what Katie would have Green's been room. Katie's room, yeah. Okay. It's today set up to represent how it would have looked when the last Green descendant living here spent her time here. So this is Elizabeth okay. Margaret's room. So mid, late 1800s or? Uh, yeah, the 1890s. She 1890s, passed away in the okay. 1890s. So this is kind of set up in that sense. We kind of try to make it look like she just left. She was actually born in this room. Um, this was her mom's room. The husband and wives kind of slept in separate rooms throughout the time okay. of her room here. So this is her mother's room. Um, so she's born here. Raised in this room, often children, if they didn't have a servant that took care of the kids, children would often stay with mom in the trundle bed. Oh, nice. So they were old enough to move on upstairs. We do know most of the green children did exactly that. They stayed kind of in their mom's care and then eventually went upstairs where there were other rooms where the kids stayed. I love our local Rhode Island history. When you ask most people, especially colonial, early revolution, that, that is like my time that I just love. When you ask most people questions of the revolution, the majority of people think of Boston, Massachusetts. You True. get a lot of, uh, oh, Paul Revere and Lexington and Concord and all of this. Most people don't even realize that 80% of the war was fought down south. That's true, yeah. And when, when you think of it, they're like, and you tell people that, especially here, they're like, really, the revolution was fought down there? <laughs> it's like barely any of it happened up here. And they all think of like, you know, Massachusetts as being the starting point of the revolution. You hear of the Boston Tea Party and this and that. We... We're burning ships here before the Boston Tea Party. We declared our independence two months before any of the other 12 colonies. 
you know, Rhode Island Independence Day is May 4th. Everybody else is July 4th. Well, <laughs> we, were, we were a rebellious little state long before everybody else. And, you know, that history you just don't hear. You don't think of Rhode Island as being like the revolutionary place that it truly is. Yeah. You know, from all the wonderful patriots and families and stories we have from here, it's very sad that you don't hear of it as much. We have events that predate even the Gatsby. So for instance, in 1764, I believe it was, we took over a fort in Newport that was under British control, took, hopped on their cannons and started shooting their cannons at the HMS St. John. Um, we went onto other boats, the Moonstone, the Squirrel, we were taken there. The, the British would row in, they'd hit a tavern, we would steal their rowboat, drag it into the town square and burn it so they couldn't row back out. Um, in 1769, we cut down the mast of the HMS Liberty, um, dragged it into town, erected it with a Patriot flag on it, called it the first Liberty Pole, cut the Liberty loose from its mooring, it ended up running aground on Goat Island and we set that on fire. So even prior to the Gatsby, we were burning stuff here and rebelling against the British long before others. And nobody knows that. Well, and again, hopefully with, you know, these kind of visits and stuff, we can get more people aware of Rhode Island's cool. role. Yeah. Huge role for yeah. smallest state, yeah. right? But Smallest state, a big part in it that we, we often get forgotten for. Yeah, exactly. All right, so another bedroom here on the second yep. floor. So this bedroom here would have been uh, Nathaniel's brother Jacob's. So okay. Nathaniel builds the house. Uh, he does move in here. It's his house, but he has his brother and his sister-in-law moving with him. So this is Jacob's okay. room, and his wife Peggy would have been in the next room over. So, okay, so same thing, husband and wife, yeah. separate rooms, separate rooms, connected by the little yeah. the hallway there. Some of the things in this room are actually kind of cool. The candle stand, the little end table with tray there, uh, and. All of the artifacts on it, with the exception of the lantern, were actually owned by Nathaniel's brother, Jacob. Okay, cool. Uh, the chair here was actually owned by their mother. Um, that is more or less a nursing chair, if you will. Um, so you can almost kind of picture their mom sitting there with a little baby Nathaniel. Yeah. Like, you know? Wow. Woodpecker. That's a woodpecker? That's a woodpecker. <laughs> I was like, man, it's a steady knock. That's cool. I do also like the, uh, I guess, shutters or sure. blinds, wooden blinds and doors. So they are shutters. Uh, by the time Nathaniel was building this house, they kind of didn't serve the same purpose. But originally when shutters were inside a house like this, they were often referred to as Indian shutters. They were a sense of home security. Okay. You know, we're coming here, we're taking land from people, we're ticking them off and they're not happy with us. So you would often put shutters in your house to keep them and other things. You know, when, when, in the sense of when Nathaniel, when he builds this house in 1770, the fear of the Native Americans coming here wasn't so great. They weren't, sure. you know, they, that wasn't such a problem by that time period. So it's more likely that he builds the house with these indoor shutters as a way of like, you know, this was wilderness when he moved out here. You know, there weren't very, there wasn't anything going on. So he's kind of moving out to the middle of nowhere. So it's, it's kind of that home protection sense. And then eventually you see shutters, you know, move to the outside of the house and they protect your windows from glass. And then eventually they just become obsolete because glass becomes better. Now they're more of a decorative thing. Yeah, so now everyone's shutters are just glued to the sides right. of the windows. It's they don't move. Yeah, they don't serve, serve no purpose. purpose. But because, originally they yeah. started as a home defense kind of. Yeah, that is interesting. This is actually an original French Charlieville. Uh, it was donated to us and said that it was actually uh, one of the ones that were brought here by the French when they came. Really? Yeah, so we lacked muskets and whatnot when we were first trying to fight the British and after the French pledged their allegiance to us, they brought I think like 2,000 of these over and supposedly this is one of them. Um, but it was said that it has been sporterized. Um, which yeah, it looks a little short from yeah. what I read. Yeah, often people would do things to them, like I know it was even very common in like World War II, they would bring back rifles 
uh, and then do things to kind of make them more comfortable to either hunt with or do things. So cut like the swivel slings off and change silly things on them. But it is said that that is one of those original French shots. It's videos. pretty awesome. And then just a lot of other really neat displays in here. Dedicated to Nathaniel Green, of course. Yeah, those are the many faces of the general. Uh, most portraits that people see, um, such as the portrait downstairs and even the one here on the painting, uh, they're kind of, if you will, I guess we like to say like photoshopped kind of. You know, <laughs> yeah. we think these, touched up. <laughs> yeah, we think these are actually more of a an appropriate depiction of Nathaniel. Uh, we think it was somebody who kind of more knew him on an intimate basis, sat down and drew him. Whereas like the portrait on the plate and even the portrait that we saw downstairs, you're going somewhere and you are paying someone to paint your bust. So very similar to like us, our families used to drag us to like Sears to get our yeah, family photos. Yeah. You gotta look your best. You know, and sometimes even in today's standards, you often Photoshop pictures. Yep, that's true. So if you're going and getting your bust painted, they're not gonna kind of paint you to look kind of haggard and old. They're, they're, you're gonna kind of put your best bust forward. Yeah, it's so. the, the Green family were heavily involved in not just the military, but like local. Yeah, there are quite a few of them involved in military standards. And you know, even his brother, his brother didn't actually fight in the war, but his brother goes on, he is marked as a, you know, patriot. He has a grave marker. Uh, he's listed as a patriot. He played a lot in the correspondence, the Committee of Safety, uh, helping his brother get things. Um, so he's, cool. you know, patriotic in his own way of playing. He didn't fight in the battle, but he played a lot of backroom stuff to help make it get, you know. Yeah, oftentimes just as important, you yeah. know, arguably. And who's this? Uh, this gentleman here is George Sears Green, again, another distant cousin of Nathaniel's. He was actually born in Appenog, Rhode Island, and he went on to be a general during the Civil War. But after he gives the house to his brother, the brother and all the brother's children and stuff and whatnot are buried out of the family plot. As time goes on, they realize that they need to kind of set aside some money for the upkeep of the family cemetery. So they do. This is Jabez's original stone. Some time goes by and they realize, hey, we need to build him, you know, buy him a new stone. It's starting to wear out, it's getting old. So they do. They buy him a new stone. Unfortunately, today his new stone is broken. Oh no. Okay. Yeah. Uh, in the 90s, our cemetery was really overgrown and nobody would go down there and take care of it and a bunch of kids smashed pretty much all the stones in there. Um, but anyway, they buy him the new stone. Years go on, time goes on, this stone gets forgotten. Um, about 10-ish years ago, we had a gentleman on the roof doing uh, work on the cottage. And he looks down and realizes in the bush that there's part of this stone. Wow. We dig it out, and we were able to determine that it was Jabez's through the work of this gentleman, James Arnold, uh, in the 19th century. He goes around and actually transcribes whatever he can off of the almost 4,000 historical cemeteries in Rhode Island. Just writes like incredible books about every cemetery he finds here in the state. So at the time we were able to read it, we were able to determine that it was Jabez's stone. It's got the same writing down there. But then we flip it over and it's got a rest in peace, like Maximus or something silly on the other side. Come to find out, as I mentioned to you a few minutes ago, the caretakers used to live in here. In 1924, we built the caretakers cottage, 27. They're moving into there. The original caretakers at the time that were living here was a young man, his wife, and their kids. Well, what does any good parents do for their children when you're moving into like your first own home? You get your kid a puppy. So the caretakers, when they moved into the house, bought a puppy for their kid. Years go on and the puppy passes away. They end up recycling Jabez's old stone for their dog. So on the other side, it's got a rest in peace to their dog. I think it's named like Maximus or something silly, but uh, it, it's kind of a, a silly little piece. You know, we, we don't always talk about it, but we do, you know, yeah. it, it's, the repurposed stone. Yeah, and like you said, you know, people lived here in the property and yeah. things for decades yeah. as well after, you know, Nathaniel Green. So it's cool to see those little pieces, right. those little All personal sides. Part of the history in some way of, you know, why the house is here and even the people who helped maintain to keep the house here, you know? Yeah. It's the caretaker's dog. <laughs> it, it's also a little history that, that makes it so great.
And here we are looking at the front side of the house, which has a cannon on display off front. And this side actually would have been overlooking the ironworks and all the business going on here on Nathaniel Green's property. So this would have been the front door where all guests would have came to. And Josh actually told me a pretty cool story that, um, you know, after the war when Nathaniel Green returned, the Marquis de Lafayette came with him and they actually stood here by the front door of his home while, you know, hundreds if not thousands gathered from all the neighboring towns as far away as Providence even to come meet their native son as well as this, you know, unique foreign French general that they've heard so much about. All right, now I am walking further into the property here at the Nathaniel Green Homestead to check out the family cemetery that he mentioned. So uh, if you're done with the house tour, you just kind of wander down the field, down the hill out here and you'll see the stone wall and you, you can't miss it. And they actually have a, an interpretive sign down here to give some of the history, but it says the first Green family internment occurred in 1786 with the death of Miss Margaret Green, daughter of Jacob and Margaret Green. And Jacob was General Nathaniel Green's brother. And it also goes into a little bit of the history of Nathaniel Green's death and burial. And uh, some of you may not know this, but Nathaniel Green's not actually buried here at his home. He's not even buried in Rhode Island. Uh, he actually died at his plantation, Mulberry Grove, in Georgia and for his efforts in the war effort in the South, the state of Georgia gifted him this plantation, formerly owned by a loyalist. And uh, unfortunately at the age of 44, Nathaniel Green died of sunstroke and uh, he's buried down there. And there's a little bit of a neat kind of history behind uh, where he was initially buried in the Graham vault, the Graham family vault. And uh, later in uh, 1902, his uh, remains were actually reinterred under a uh, monument at Johnson Square in Savannah, which you can see today. So it really is quite an interesting history. Um, and here's a list of everybody in the Green family that are actually interred here. It's like the gravesite here with the uh, flag denoting a war veteran. I can't quite make out the, uh, the name there, but I was able to read the one here for Dr. Jabez Green, who was the son of Jacob Green. And Jacob Green, of course, was the brother of Nathaniel, so Jabez would have been the nephew of General Nathaniel Green. And, you know, next to him and beyond as you walk around, like I said, you can see quite a few headstones of those who are laid to rest here. I think getting the opportunity to uh, tour the home of Nathaniel Green is always a unique experience. Uh, Josh did a great job with the tour. I learned a lot. I do every time I come here. And, uh, you know, ultimately I think it's just a good reminder that there are so many places like this around our country that are preserving our history and people taking the time out of their day to, 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 to work on homes, to preserve them, to take care of them, to interpret the history, to give tours. And, you know, if there's a historic home near you you've been meaning to check out or to take a tour of, you know, go there, go there next weekend, take the tour, check it out, uh, learn the local history from where you're at. Because I'll tell you right now, here in Rhode Island, Nathaniel Green is the native son. He's one of the most famous men of the American Revolution. And I can bet you that most of the people that live in this neighborhood or live in the area don't even know that this house is here. Or if they do, they probably drive by and think it's, you know, it's just that old home. There's a lot of them out here in New England. But uh, Nathaniel Green was one of the most important people from American history, certainly from the American Revolutionary War. And uh, it's pretty cool that his home still stands, the Mount Vernon of Rhode Island, as they call it.